switch your we do encourage you to switch your cameras on because it is nice to see you all. Um, so welcome to the Human Rights Education Review 2023 webinar series that we are running in conjunction with the World Education Research Association International Research Network on Human Rights Education. It's really, really nice to see so many people from different parts of the world and uh, we're glad to have you with us this evening when we will be discussing how human rights education might support uh, the process of child safeguarding, particularly in schools. We have three wonderful speakers with us this evening, all experts in this area and all who've done research in this area. Um, before I introduce you to each of them, I'll just explain how our, our webinar will work this evening. I will invite our first speaker to talk for 20 minutes, and then we will move without questions to our second presentation, which will also run for 20 minutes. And what we ask you to do is if you have questions, particularly for our first speaker that you might forget, to jot them down, um, while she's speaking so that we, you don't forget them because you'll have to wait until the end of the presentations before you can ask them. If you've got questions, we also invite you to put them in the chat. And can you please save the chat simply for questions to avoid um, blocking up the chat with symbols or comments or uh, anything like that. If you just keep it clear for questions, then it will be easier for us to see what questions are coming in. So I'll begin by introducing our first speaker. Keshti Dragadalan is uh, employed at Tonsberg Municipality in Norway, where she has been working on questions relating to uh, child safeguarding for quite a long while. She's a, she's a teacher by profession. And we're very proud to have her on this uh, webinar series shortly after she completed her PhD in this field. So welcome, Keshti, and congratulations on your PhD, which she got at the University of Southeastern Norway. Our second two speakers are Ali Struthers, who's at Warwick um, Law School in the United Kingdom. And Ali is uh, I believe, Associate Professor in Law, and her colleague, Ruth Brittle, who's at the University of Leicester. And perhaps I should add that Ruth, like Kershti, has a very concrete, practical experience in um, uh, child safeguarding because uh, her academic interests address children's rights, but she's also a solicitor who's done work in child protection. So we're very Pleased to have you with us, Ruth. Two of our presenters have uh, have had articles published in Human Rights Education Review, and it's on the focus of those two articles that we've invited them to speak this evening. So if you want to follow through this, this webinar with some reading, we encourage you to go to Human Rights Education Review, check out Keshti's article and check out Ali's article there. I'm now going to hand over uh, to Kashti um, and invite her to, to kick off this evening's um, work. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Audrey. Um, and thank you also to you uh, for uh, both of you for inviting me. I am very, very excited to be able to be here today and co-present with, with my wonderful colleagues, Alison Strother and Ruth Brito. Um, and welcome to everyone um, watching. Um, I recognize actually several of you, so it's so nice of you to check in. Okay, let me start by sharing my screen. Um, let's see. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, it's just moving too fast. So let me go um, 
back to one slide. I hope you all are seeing this now in presentation mode. So the topic of today is teachers and school safeguarding. How can human rights education help? And in planning this um, lecture, uh, I wanted to also um, start uh, with, with the title of my thesis, which is Teachers as Human Rights Defenders, Transforming Teachers' Safeguarding Role Against Harmful Sexual Behavior. And why I wanted to do that is because um, as a former teacher, I have been in um, a lot of practical dilemmas, but none challenged me more than when I first encountered harmful sexual behavior in school. And um, as opposed to when sexual abuse is committed by adults, um, the sexual abuse uh, in harmful sexual behavior is committed by other children and young people. And this actually creates a very specific dilemma where um, teachers, as human rights defenders, I will argue in this lecture, um, they will have a very unique and specific role and, and they can actually have a quite significant role for children who display this kind of behavior. Also, I've, I've been interested in challenging behavior as a teacher and how schools can be inclusive places um, and representing diversity in all forms. And again, with the sexual aspect of the challenging behavior, I, I realized very um, early on um, that that type of behavior uh, maybe challenges us more than any other challenging behavior. So um, uh, I have um, pursued a um, PhD design uh, that is actually called a public PhD, meaning that I'm employed by a Transparent Municipality uh, to um, carry out research on behalf of the municipality. And the whole point of doing that is to get a more practice oriented type of research that can help implement new and improved practices. Okay, so um, first I want to just uh, pause a little bit um, around the actual phenomenon, because why is uh, harmful sexual behavior very important to address in school? Well, um, the World Health Organization has declared um, sexual abuse against children a public health issue and is on the rise, which means that it's a very grave and enormous problem for societies worldwide. What is often less known is that, of course, these, these figures vary and, and it's very hard to get accurate numbers, but these days, um, various countries operate with between 30 to 70 percent of child sexual abuse is committed by other children and young people. And again, uh, that creates both a very specific dilemma and also um, really underlines the, the point of early intervention as being very essential. Um, so what are we talking about really when we say problematic and harmful sexual behavior? Well, Professor Simon Hackett of Durham University in England, I guess he is, um, if, if not the leading expertise, so at least one of the world's best expertise on harmful sexual behavior, um, he qualifies uh, the behavior this way. Sexual behaviors of children and young people under the age of 18 years old that are developmentally inappropriate may be harmful towards self or others or be abusive to another child, young person or adult. He has also uh, developed what is called a continuum of sexual behaviors, um, including everything from 
um, name calling and abusive language to uh, penetration. So it's 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 a continuum that really shows a breadth of um, behaviors. Um, what has been become more and more uh, apparent through um, updated research is that a high proportion of children and young people who display harmful sexual behavior actually also are exposed to adverse childhood experiences. So we do talk about children who are uh, vulnerable, uh, children who are in need of help themselves. And adverse childhood experiences, um, well, the term is mostly affiliated with the ACE study uh, carried out by Vincent Felitti and colleagues from 1998, which originally, as you can see, contained three um, categories of adverse behaviors or, or experiences. Later on, uh, these traditional categories have been criticized um, and people have uh, wanted to include other categories of adversities. And for example, uh, Finkelhor, David Finkelhor, um, um, for example, peer rejection, peer victimization and community violence may be categories that indicate even more than the traditional adverse child experiences. Uh, how the outcome can become very um, grave for children over uh, a lifetime period, actually, also when they grow up. So um, this is why um, we are talking about the very vulnerable children. And as can be seen here in the last statement, also often children struggle with uh, learning difficulties and intellectual uh, disabilities and so forth. So apparently this applies to schools and teachers and has actually um, a lot of impact on these children's school um, environment. And so, um, again, today we are focusing on the school site. And I do that too in my thesis, where I argue that the school site is a place where societal change can start, as have Shiro and so many other scholars. Um, this is the only arena in the society where all children spend a lot of time. And when it comes to safeguarding, teachers are actually in a very unique position to be potential key actors through interdisciplinary cooperation. So um, with all this backdrop, I wanted to see um, what do teachers in Norway um, how, how do they uh, respond to harmful sexual behavior? What do they know? And who do they involve? So in my survey, uh, I found that teachers reported that they found it difficult to distinguish between healthy, problematic, and harmful sexual behavior. They were also unsure of what to do when encountering harmful sexual behavior and they were unsure which services to involve when harmful sexual behavior occurred in school. So um, lack of competence, support, time and resources. It led to teachers um, really uh, feeling that safeguarding, especially against harmful sexual behavior, became an overwhelming responsibility. And, and for some teachers in my focus groups, um, they were really uh, saying that 
um, I, I do not have the competence. I do not have uh, the training. I don't know who to involve. And I also feel so alone, um, which was basically the, the findings that led to my, my supervisor, Audrey Osler and me, uh, starting to really reflect around um, what, is, what is it that can be done um, to address um, this um, emotion or this um, the overwhelming feeling of responsibility. Well, um, we wrote in the article in Human Rights Education Review that um, there needs to be a recognition of the role that emotions play and also the asymmetrical power relations uh, between, for example, teachers and the leadership in the school, but also the recognition of uh, the asymmetrical power relations between teachers and uh, children. And this is why we, um, we develop these findings into a grounded theory. And um, uh, Audrey has been the one coming up with teachers as human rights defenders. And originally it was taken from an article she had um, from uh, some time back. But we wanted to um, base um, a new approach in human rights. Um, and we call that a child rights framework, which both uh, has a base in the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the Council of Europe's Lanzarote Convention which specifically states um, that all states uh, in Europe and uh, further have a responsibility to really design framework um, to, to, uh, uh, to stop child sexual abuse. But in addition to that, we wanted to elaborate uh, by using um, human rights education and, and pair it with care-based ethics. Um, uh, taken from Nell Nodding's uh, theory. So um, we are arguing that uh, a transformative human rights education is what is needed in safeguarding. And like Nell Nodding's um, is emphasizing in her care-based ethics is uh, the point that teachers are, are the ones caring and they should also be the ones that are the 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 part the responsible for both protecting students but also modeling for them um uh how to um to deal with human rights violation and in that we um, I've just developed this uh, table in our article a little bit with the colors because we are arguing that the traditional human rights educational uh, understanding, um, it, it, it can be three different um, versions of understanding how human rights education can be taught to children. Now, conforming um, as you can see, this is more of the education uh, about human rights education, where uh, um, the most is, is um, it's, uh, the teacher is a duty bearer and should implement the mandated curriculum, whereas the reforming and uh, the transforming um, understanding of human rights education is much more the co-constructing, the dialogue, the modeling of um, understanding what human rights violations are in society and how we can challenge and be able to enact for social justice. Um, Okay, so let me, I think I'm almost out of time, but um, um, so we were, we were wanting to strengthen safeguarding theory through four, diff four principles that we talk about in the article. 
And the first, as I've mentioned, is aligning the human rights education and the care-based ethics. Um, as Again, as I said, um, as a teacher, uh, being the class leader of the fellowship or, or class community means that when, when I can guide and um, show children how to respond and relate to human rights violation also among each other, I model a behavior that they can also adopt to make empower them to be able to, they, they themselves um, to, to actually um, stand up when they meet human rights violations. And the second one is acknowledging the role of emotions, both in human rights teaching, but also in safeguarding, which we saw is, is actually a common factor in both. Because very often when human rights violations happen in the classroom or in school, um, it, it triggers the uh, grown-ups um, and often, like I refer to, teachers feel that they really lack the expertise to, to intervene appropriately. And they also uh, lack the confidence to be able to address um, the transgressing behavior in a constructive manner that also at the same time um, preserve the human dignity of all the children. Uh, again, uh, we wanted also to address the asymmetrical power, re power relations because we see that um, just as teachers need their support from, from their leadership, children also need the same support from their teachers if they're able, if, if they're gonna be able to actually call out human rights violations and uh, also act on human rights violations. They really need sensitive, attuned adults who care and who can guide the way in that process. And again, uh, with the transforming role in, in human rights education, um, being able to, to have a classroom where uh, student participation is um, an integral part of, of the day-to-day -day practice of modeling the behavior and, um, and also getting students to model behavior for each other, uh, that becomes uh, a transformative classroom where societal change can happen. So, um, um, to sum up, transformative safeguarding. What are we talking about? Well, it's securing um, children's human rights in school. And that is through strengthening teachers' um, legal literacy of transforming understanding of human rights education. And it's also to empower and support teachers to manage the emotional labor of safeguarding. And we also go a bit into detail in the article about how and um, how schools can empower teachers to manage their emotional labor. And I also argue further in, in the next article uh, that frontline services can also empower and support teachers uh, in schools to, to manage their emotional labor. And um, also, uh, a related topic that it's, is very important as well is by having an intersectional approach to safeguarding, um, there is also a much better chance of mitigate a culture gap and also to, to really empower uh, children who are often categorized as vulnerable or at risk or marginalized. So um, there are some prerequisites for this approach. Um, and the first prerequisite is that training and cooperation 
that acknowledges the role of emotions and asymmetrical power relations must be made available for all teachers everywhere and starting early. The next one is um, for teachers to be able to, to be empowered, to safeguard. They also need to know who they can contact at what point. This means that uh, the roles in interdisciplinary corporations, as well as the procedures, must be much clearly uh, clearer in in um, in the interdisciplinary cooperation. The third point, or the pr third prerequisite, is that there has to um, be more resources given to primary and secondary prevention for all relevant services. Um, I'm mostly familiar with the conditions in Norway, and I know that we do not fund um, frontline services or schools nearly enough. I mean, we, if we are really serious about having a more universal prevention and early intervention, of transgressing behavior among children, then we need to start also funding uh, schools and the early initiatives. Yeah. And so that was my presentation. Thank you very much, Kerstin. Um, And while our next two presenters are getting their um, uh, uh, presentation ready to share, I should add that Keshti has lots and lots of um, um, practical examples and very concrete examples of working in primary schools, very, very concrete work that you can read about um, in how she goes about this with teachers of young children. All her work uh, for her a PhD was done in schools for young children. So we now hand over to Ali Struthers and Ruth Brittle. So when you're ready, we look forward to hearing you both. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. And, and uh, I would like to add my thanks for the lovely introductions at the start of the session. Uh, it's lovely to be here. And, and like you say, nice to see so many people from so many different places. So so thank you all. Um, I'm just moving my little image of myself out of the way because I'm very much in the way of the slides. Uh, so Ruth and I are talking today about, as Audrey said, I had an article published in Human Rights Education Review about um, the intersection between, or the lack of intersection between human rights education and safeguarding. Uh, and Ruth and I followed, so I wrote the article and Ruth and I then contacted each other and we did a, a follow-up uh, data collection around this issue about um, the intersection between human rights and safeguarding across Scotland and England. So our presentation will be split a little bit into me talking a little bit about the background to our data collection in the form of what I was um, identifying as the problem in that uh, human rights education review article. And then we'll speak a little bit about the data that we have collected with a view to hearing what you all think about that data. It's very much scoping data. We're really interested to find out um, uh, people's opinions about that so uh, if we go to the first slide please, I'm so sorry if you want to just click in all the uh, the writing because I've, I've done that thing where I've put it all in individual individual clicks and I'm not clicking so the the basis of the article really was or during my PhD which was around human rights education and the barriers to um, to that being delivered in schools I had done uh, research with teachers, empirical research with teachers around those barriers to human rights education. And safeguarding was something that came up a lot in my um, PhD interviews. And it was one of these things that I, I parked. I wrote a post-it note to uh, look into this further uh, and, and parked it as something that was really interesting because I couldn't really see much connection at that time being made in the existing literature between uh, human rights and safeguarding and what human rights education could actually contribute to safeguarding. Uh, it seemed to be something that there was a lot of literature around safeguarding, there was a lot of literature around human rights education, but there, there, there was this disconnect. And I think a lot of that was related at the time to this, um, the sort of silos that people tend to work in, which is something Laura Lundy's talk, talked about a lot, 
the silos that you tend to be a human rights education law person or you tend to be a human rights education education person and they, we, we tend to work in in silos and I think that this is now a topic that is is coming to the fore a lot more and there's there are far more people as this seminar shows there are more people who are working on this topic and there are more people who are interested in it so I basically argued thanks for I argued yeah no the next one's fine thank you I argued in that article that um it basically followed on it I sort of viewed it as a follow-on piece to Laura Lundy and Gabriella Martinez Saint's piece in Human Rights Education Review which was talking about the importance of law and legal knowledge and you can see from this quote this is from their wonderful 2018 article uh, so I'll, I'll just leave you to read the quote but essentially saying oh. that actually children need to have legal literacy they need to know the law and be able to identify breaches of human rights in their own lives. So uh, Laura and Gabriella spoke very much to the slight tendency within human rights education to think of it as we're teaching children lofty ideals or aspirational rights or, you know, a very much a sort of normative approach to uh, educating about human rights. And what they argued and what I followed through into this piece is actually, you know, if children are to recognize violations of rights in their own lives, they need the knowledge of what those violations look like. So they need a more pragmatic approach to being able to identify those violations in their own lives. And importantly, then being able to vocalize that they are experiencing these, um, these issues. So if we go to the next slide, please, Ruth. So in the article, I, the article was about England uh, specifically. I didn't look at, at Scotland at that time. It's something that Ruth will, will talk about later when, when we talk about the data, that there may be differences here. But in England, safeguarding, it's taken seriously. And that's, that's very, very important. It's something that teachers receive training on continuously. It's something that there needs to be a designated safeguarding lead. There has to be school guidance. They have to follow government guidance. There has to be this continuity of training of teachers in safeguarding. And you can see there um, from the government publication, Keeping Children Safe in Education, you can see the, uh, the definition of what safeguarding is considered to be. Now, this emphasis on safeguarding within the education system has sadly come from a series of tragedies where it was identified that not enough was done to protect children uh, one that, that that really that really upsets me is Daniel Pelka because Daniel Pelka was Coventry based. That's where I'm I I'm based. The school that Daniel was at is is quite local to Warwick University, and I speak about Daniel's case in the article as one that really highlights the failings in our current safeguarding provisions. In that through no sizable individual fault no teacher was able to identify the frequency and severity of Daniel's injuries because teachers did note that he had bruises and they did note that he had other facial injuries they noted he had an obsessive nature around food there were indications that something was not right at home but there wasn't enough of an identification and record of a pattern of this happening to identify Daniel as being really at risk and this is where I argue in the article that the current system of safeguarding in England relies very much on a passive approach to teachers noticing that something is not right escalating that to the relevant agencies and the relevant agencies having the capacity to be able to deal with that it's a it's a lot of links in a chain that there are really, really obvious ways where the, the, the links can be broken. And Daniel Pelka's case really high, identified that to a huge extent. Once there has been one of these high profile tragedies, there's a serious case review of what happened in that um, particular circumstance. In almost every serious case review that I read in preparation for this article, there was an identification that no effort was made at any point in the process. So from school all the way through to agencies that may have been involved 
at no point was there an attempt made to speak to the child to hear what the child had to say about what they were experiencing at home and this really made me think that the connections between human rights education which is all about providing children with a voice need they need to be stronger in education if we can improve the ability of children to not only recognize their rights as Laura and Gabriella identify, but to vocalize those rights as well, to recognize them, to understand that what they're experiencing at home is a violation of their rights, to vocalize that to a relevant person who will take it seriously. Again, another right of the child, being able to express an opinion, have that opinion taken seriously. There needs to be all of these human rights education elements interwoven with our um, safeguarding procedures. I've jumped way ahead on the slides, I think, Ruth. <laughs> really sorry, I'm just talking without any reference to the slides. But yeah, so, so just on that last slide, it just said, you know, the, the real point in Daniel Pelka's case was that he hadn't he hadn't been spoken to. Attempts had not been made to speak to him. He um attempts have been made to speak in, to speak sorry to his sister I believe but again that's not Friends enough that's, that's not engagement. putting the child at the center of the, well, um, that, of the learning processes and I, I stopped in that article by, um, oh Edward I think you're possibly not muted Edward I thanks Edward I talked in the um I've lost my shot. I've lost that particular train of thought. If we go to the, if we go to the next slide, Ruth. So in my um, PhD thesis, I did sort of arrive at the, I suppose, the always standard uh, recommendation in our field that, that teachers need to be better equipped to deal with um, rights issues, to be, to be more aware of um, the UNCRC to utilize that in their practice, to be less afraid of human rights terminology in the classroom. All of these things that came up in my thesis, I think are relevant to how we can improve school safeguarding. Schools have to do safeguarding. They, as I say, it's mandatory. The training is mandatory. So a lot of teachers in my research for my PhD that I pulled through into the article said, if you incorporate rights into safeguarding training, that is something all teachers have to do. That is something that is continuously updated. Is there a way that if we interweave that into, um, say if we interweave human rights education into safeguarding training, teachers are gonna be more comfortable with using that language, with having those approaches and with teaching children essentially to use the language of rights to identify what they feel is not going on at home. And we know from, from my own research, we know from other research that's been carried out that when, te when pupils know about their rights, they are able to vocalize those, they are able to say, this is happening, I don't think it's right and to take that to a member of staff and to have that actioned. So it gives, I suppose it gives human rights education an element of legitimacy and it gives teachers the ability to talk about it without fear that they'll seeming to be political or biased or all of these other barriers that have been identified to human rights education. I think that's the last of my slides. So Ruth and I essentially, oh, there is one final quote there. Ruth and I uh, use this basically as a basis to go out and find out what is happening um, with safeguarding in Scotland and in England. So I'm going to hand over to Ruth now to talk about that data. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? I'm just, uh, for some reason it's not, oh, there it is, I found it now. Sorry, I kept losing the little cursor. <laughs> OK, so our scoping survey, and I'll be very quick on this, uh, you know, we, we can share our slides uh, afterwards, but basically to collect data. So based on on Ali's research about knowledge and attitudes towards human rights and to look at how human rights approaches are embedded in school safeguarding practice. And we sent this survey to um, teachers, designated safeguarding leads, designated child protection officers, in England and in Scotland, because we really wanted to look at this comparison between what was happening in Scotland, particularly with the UNCRC uh, coming into uh, into law in Scotland, but also it, it being quite an essential element of teacher training in Scotland uh, as compared to uh, England. 
So we did it in uh, July, June and July 2021, and we got 617 uh, responses uh, in total. Um, and this is just some of the kind of findings that uh, that that we, we uh, found from our survey. Um, most teachers agree, thankfully, <laughs> that human rights education is important. Um, and generally, we find the Scottish teachers have better knowledge of UNCRC than English teachers or the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And overall, primary school teachers, so that's that's from age five to 11, uh, teachers who are teaching ages five to 11 are more confident about HR and, 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 and human rights and that informed safeguarding uh, practice. So uh, as you can see there, we had um, 380 teachers in total and you can see the kind of uh, uh, percentage between uh, England and Scotland. So the green is Scotland and the blue is England and then 237 uh, designated safeguarding uh, leads. So just looking at some of the data uh, quite quickly here, um, uh, the knowledge uh, of human rights, you can see that on this, this is this is where the data gets quite interesting. So if you look, the, the blue is, 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 is England um, and the, the kind of lighter green is Scotland. And then the, 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 the darker green is the rights respecting schools uh, in, in England and, and Scotland. Um, so you can see there's a difference there. Knowledge of human rights, uh, obviously in rights respecting schools, people are very confident. Uh, and then in, in England, you can see that there, there's less confidence about that uh, in terms of what they know. And then looking at the awareness of the UNCRC, um, thankfully in our rights respecting schools, that was 99%. Um, and then in Scotland, it was very high at 97%. And there is some awareness, obviously, in Scotland and England, and that's probably growing because I know now in the, uh, the the document that all schools in England get, the Keeping Children Safe in Education, the UNCRC is specifically referred to now. Now, that wasn't the case uh, a couple of years ago, but it is in the latest edition of that. And then looking at um, how um, children's rights informs practice, uh, again, there's a little bit of a difference between uh, England and um uh, Scotland there and less confidence. So this was all about the confidence with human rights and the UNCRC. And then if we look at how human rights education is embedded both in the curriculum and in, in, in safeguarding, um, you can see there, 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 there starts to be um, some, some stark uh, differences. Um, so there, there's confidence, um, you know, 75%, I guess, in England and, and 90, uh, 82% in, in Scotland. Uh, that there is teaching of the human rights uh, of human rights education in the curriculum, um, and there there are more confidence about that actually being embedded in safeguarding, and that would be safeguarding approaches within the school. But there was an interesting, and I thought that, that this was quite an interesting kind of disjoint and disconnect between you know in a, being embedded in safeguarding, but actually teaching it as part of safeguarding. So. Children are taught how to be, you know, how to safeguard themselves in, in, in the curriculum in, in, in England and Scotland, uh, and human rights is taught, and how human rights education is taught. But there seems to be a disconnect there between uh, human rights and safeguarding. And you can see, yeah, you know, the, the figures for England uh, are, are 50, you know, 59% uh, and 73% for Scotland. But in the rights respecting schools, there was more confidence that it was taught as part of safeguarding. And then just looking, this is the last uh, bar chart, just looking at the safeguarding and pupil voice. Um, you know, there was there was strong confidence in in, in all the uh, teachers and uh, DSLs that, was, that responded to our survey that there was pupil voice on human rights violations. So that 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 in 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 a sense, what the question that we asked was whether or not uh, children in schools, both primary and secondary, felt able to talk about human rights violations. Um, and, and and within the safeguarding context, um, and that action was taken, as you can see, in response to those, they felt that was um, uh, responded to. However, when we asked the question, can you think of any examples of pupils raising human rights violations? Um, people uh, didn't didn't come up with those those examples and couldn't think of those examples. So although people felt there was a human voice there, they weren't able to pinpoint examples of that hand now whether or not that's because it just didn't happen in those schools which i doubt or they just weren't 
able to make that connect between human rights violations and what was happening in safeguarding practice. So that's just a, a summary of what was happening in rights respecting schools, the UNICEF um, uh, uh, certificate for rights respecting schools. Uh, as you would expect, that was much, much higher in terms of their confidence to human rights and embedding human rights in safeguarding practice. And in a sense, what what we would like to see happening is that being rolled out to uh, to all schools in England and Wales. So I just wanted to finish with some caution uh, with our data set. Um, our numbers were fairly low, really. We sent out hundreds of thousands. I mean, <laughs> Ali will, will testify to that, that we, that we sent our emails to lots of schools. And education in England, as you know, was quite fragmented now with uh, the academy set up. So we were uh, emailing um, multi-academy trusts. We were uh, emailing individual schools. We were emailing local authorities. And we, a lot of the issues that we had were really related to the pandemic, you know, and, and schools just were coming back after the pandemic at that time. End of year, it was the end of term and a bit of survey exhaustion. We got a lot of emails coming back saying we're not going to take part uh, because our teachers do a lot of surveys and they don't want to do this one. Also, be aware that data may be skewed. We have a lot of responses from the rights respecting schools. Maybe the responses we got were, were from teachers that already knew something about human rights were um, you know, interested in human rights or whatever, and more primary school teachers responded overall um, than, than secondary school teachers. And we only have teachers' views, and part of that was time constraints, that we didn't have time to get the ethics approval. We had a questionnaire and survey ready for children, uh, but we didn't have time uh, to get the ethics approval in order to send that out. So what's next is, is, is hopefully looking to broaden this uh, and and get certainly the people voice in there and maybe looking towards what one thing that 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 that, that Ali and I talked about is this this approach to um, safeguarding, including the voice, but having a child friendly safeguarding policy uh, that includes that voice. OK, and that is me. Thank you. Thank, thank you Sorry, both. That was quite quick. <laughs> thank you both, both Keshti and um... Ali and, and uh, Ruth had to run through their presentations very, very fast. And um, we have one or two questions coming up. But before we take all the, those questions that are appearing, some relate to your methods and others relate to, um, yeah, a lot of like methods, actually. I'd just like if Kirsty would actually reflect on Norway. And no, we know Norway is public image, as a rights respecting country, teachers um, uh, presumably know a lot about human rights. Um, I'd like you to reflect on what they do actually know and how they relate that to care based, care based ethics, if at all, in the current situation, very briefly, Keshti. So we have yeah. something concrete from you too. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, there have been some studies on, on let's just do pupil participation in Norway. Um, and, and as you're right, Norway has a very strong image about this human rights uh, defending country. We are very demo democratic. And, um, but then um, the studies about the pupil participation uh, always reveal that um, it's not really authentic pupil participation. It's more of um, you want to choose a very like superficial things. It's not really authentic um, as including children in a part of, of uh, the um, decision process in school. And, and, and teachers as well, um, although they they know, you know, certain um the most common human rights, actually their their legal literacy is is very much lacking. Um, and so and and also uh, it it reflects thereafter to in, in the students as well. Um, I did um, focus groups with pupils in secondary schools and I asked them to to relate to it. Well, I asked them if there's racism in Norway and uh, most of them and, and it was more ethnically white group. But most of the students, they were saying that no racism is more uh, we connected to slavery. 
it's not really happening in, in Norway. But whereas we started unpacking and, and exploring the issue, then suddenly many students were like, but this is racism. So, so I guess, yeah. Recognizing that rights might be more problematic then. Okay, I think that's very helpful. And also in terms of care, how do teachers relate this to care-based ethics? Do they see their job as care carers or do they see their job as transmitting knowledge? Actually, they um, there there is still a dominant discourse in Norway that teachers view themselves as transmitting knowledge, and um, so so um, understanding how how health the the mental health and physical health impacts learning is still lacking in in both teacher education and and uh, among most schools i would argue even though some schools are becoming more trauma informed um and some very very few schools are are really embracing that um now but that is more the exception than the okay. rule thank mm. you very much keshti i think that um relate that ties the two presentations more closely together so we have some kind of points of, of discussion I have um a question from canada uh adobe argu please can we take your question can you read it out to us or tell us okay, what your question uh, is welcome all uh, right good evening everyone uh, I was wondering if you people uncovered any constraints with the teachers applying to the human rights safeguarding um, policies. Right. So were there external issues that prevented teachers from complying with policy recommendations, either in England or Scotland or yes. in Norway? Um, Ali, do you want to take this or, or Ruth? Um, I don't, I mean, because we had a, it was a quantitative survey that we distributed. We unfortunately didn't have that sort of qualitative feedback from the teachers. We only gained an overview because this was essentially intended as a scoping survey to find out what was happening. So we, and we, we very much intend to follow it up with more detailed qualitative study around around I think what you're saying which is what are the what are the barriers to to teachers implementing this and again that is something that links very much to previous work I've done um and it always comes back to the same problems I think and um, this is something that others will be able to speak to who perhaps will have more practical experience uh, of working in safeguarding but it, it's it's the kind of human rights element being seen as a bit controversial and I you know in this day and age it, it's mind-boggling that, that that remains the case um, but I think it's just we need to overcome that slight fear of this concept and terminology and what it entails with human rights and mainstream the mainstream the language and mainstream the ideas and equip children with uh, a familiarity with human rights and the ability to use that language freely and then you, we, we're almost changing hopefully cultural perceptions of what human rights are through the next generation but it's it's a bit of a long game that's what I would say and I would say at the moment we still face the same barriers constantly than the, the ones that I identified in my PhD that come down essentially to slightly less favorable attitudes towards human rights amongst some uh, some sectors of society. Thank you. Anybody else wants to add anything to that? Um, Kirsty, can you give us any practical constraints on teachers in Norway because your study was qualitative in part? Well, um, I I think also it's true what Alison is saying uh, that because um, teachers lack a more in depth knowledge of human rights then usually it's it's perceived a bit controversial um and and we have been out now in pilot schools where we are pioneering a, a sort of like a comprehensive sexuality education um program 
and as a first lecture, we we go through the human rights aspect and 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 the professional mandate and really links it to rights of children um, to try and and have um, a competence um, or increasing teachers' competence in how human rights violations actually um, how how it looks like in practice. Mm. And in terms of safeguarding, do teachers have practical barriers to that in Norway? Yeah, and I think uh, it also comes uh, with the lack of knowledge uh, where, for example, a, a, a tool of like traffic light tool, like the one in, in England uh, from Brook, uh, which divides the sexual behavior into to green, amber and red. I think... Um, that as a tool can often be used very instrumental. So instead of being a starting point for reflection and dialogue, it can be a checklist where you, okay, we see this behavior and this behavior, that means this is this is the case. Um, I, yeah. Thank you. And Michael Green is saying that to promote the voice of children, the CRC emphasizes that children need to be listened to non-judgmentally. They have to trust the adults to be responsive and that something can be done. He's saying that there's a good deal of research that school bonding or attachment is essential to promote trust. So that's, I think, supporting some of the things we've heard. Um, we had two very practical questions um, from Edwina and Ricardo concerning the data that you are handling, um, Ali and Ruth. The first one is uh, asking, did, do you think, um, did you collect data from secondary schools? Why do you think primary school teachers were confident? And were you comparing that level of confidence to secondary school teachers? If you could briefly answer that, Ruth. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll briefly answer that. Yes, we did. We gathered uh, data. We we wrote to secondary schools and primary schools. We got more data from primary schools. We had more primary schools respond. Um, and I think, um, I, I mean, we didn't, as 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 Ali said, we didn't do a qualitative um, kind of survey. So I don't know why primary schools um, were more confident. Um, but we did compare uh, their answers, you know, in, in, in terms of, you know, because we, we did it, you know, on a, on a five rating um, and primary school teachers tended to be the most confident about human rights and about the UNCRC and embedding it in practice than secondary school. And, and again, if, you know, funding to follow this up for a qualitative study, we, we would we would like to explore those reasons, you know, why primary school teachers uh, feel that way compared to secondary school. Thank you. And Ricardo asks you, um, do you, did you take steps, perhaps this has to be yes or no, but did you take steps to minimise the effects of social desirability in your survey? In other words, did you did you take any steps to, to make sure that, these, that the teachers weren't simply telling you what they thought you wanted to hear? No. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> the nature of the survey and again i think that's a qualitative you know kind of uh issue for that to because to, i i'm sure and you know ali and i talked about this when we when we got the data you know some of the people that responded were probably self-selecting people that were interested in human rights were aware of human rights so it yeah i i, I don't you know we didn't minimize that i think yeah. I, I always I, this was a question that was asked on my thesis as well at the time you know if you have teachers interested in human rights, then your, your data is going to be skewed. And my answer to that sort of is that is true. But if that if if that is the case, this is the best case scenario. And it's not exactly ideal. Do you know what I mean? Like if these are the teachers that are keen and we only have 75 percent of teachers in England who know what the UNCRC is, that's problematic. The rest who see human rights and they go, I'm not gauging that, don't like human rights. The, the 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 true figure would be lower, and actually that becomes more of a problem. So it it is a it is a risk, but I think it's a risk that exacerbates the problem rather than mitigates the problem. If you see what I mean. Right. Thank you. Piers is raising a question which I'm just going to leave you with because we haven't got time to discuss it, but I think it's an interesting one. And he's asking, do you agree that there's a positive duty on the state to enable a child's entitlement to be heard? in the safeguarding pro 
process in my own work in criminal justice, I am looking at the right of children and vulnerable persons, regardless of age, to be effectively partic to effectively participate in order to be heard. So, um, Piers is, is raising a question there about uh, the the right to be heard and the right to participate and 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 the relationship. I'm sorry we haven't got any time to discuss that important question right now. That's why I've I've read it out for peers rather than engaged in in more discussion. But I would just like to thank all our presenters this this evening and to say to you all that these slides and this presentation will be available on YouTube just as soon as we can do it. Let's say within. Uh, the next month, and that we have another date for your diaries, that on Wednesday, the 15th of November, we will have our next session when Ricardo, who is sitting there, maybe you can wave everybody now, Ricardo, so they can see you, um, we'll be talking about a completely different um, aspect of human rights education, I think. He's going to be exploring the relationship between language education and uh, and uh, how it contributes and enables or otherwise human rights. I very much hope you'll be able to join us. The details of that session up on the Human Rights Education Review website already, and we will follow that through with an opportunity to register very, very soon. Um, I see we have people here from Japan, from Bangladesh, from Canada, the UK, Germany, Georgia, United States. We're really pleased that you've all come together this evening. I want to alert you to one further opportunity and to look out for the call for papers. On the 19th of April in London, we'll be having a face-to-face -face, uh, one day uh, conference. I know those of you who are students can, uh, in uh, places like Canada can apply for funding. I hope that you will join us then and I hope that many of you will consider uh, making presentations then, either poster presentations or spoken presentations, and that if you have research that's far, far more advanced than that, that you will consider writing that research up and sending it to us at Human Rights Education Review. Thank you everyone for participating, especially our, pres our three presenters, and I look forward to meeting you all again in November. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you.